Hello again, music theory students and musicians. This is Eric, and I'm your music theory tutor. I hope these videos are helping. And today, in particular, we're going to be studying the harmonic progression, and we're going to create a progression from a given bass line. So, thank you for joining, and let's get started. Okay, so here we are. We're in chapter 8, and we're doing letter I, number 1. So, what we have to do is assign Roman numerals to each of these bass notes, and we use triads only in root position and first inversion. So, we have to create a chord progression based on these bass notes. And to do that, we should review the harmonic progression and how chords like to follow each other. So here's another lesson from Toby Rush. And it's a really cool rule of thumb to have. Uh, as you can see, you can go up a second, down a third, down a fifth, or up a fourth, whichever one you like. Uh, so here's some good points to know that the one chord uh, any chord can move to the one chord and the one chord can move to any chord okay any chord can move to the dominant and the diminished seven chord the leading tone triad must move to the tonic so we've got to keep those things in mind. And also we have the harmonic progression from the book. And you can see we have the three, six, two, five, one. And sometimes we like to use uh, the four or the diminished seven. Okay, so let's get started. Okay, so our next step is to create a chord progression using these bass notes. So, we're in the key of F, and our first note is an F. So, to establish our key, let's just start with a one chord. That was easy. Now, our next note is a B flat. So, the most obvious choice would be the B-flat major, the four chord, the B-flat and the bass. We could use the G minor in first inversion uh, because the B-flat is the third of the G minor chord. That would be a one to a two, um, which is possible, it's okay. Um, but I think we'll go with the B flat major, the one to the four. It's more common. And then the C, that would be the five chord, one, four, five, is a good way to establish your key at the beginning. So let's just do that. Now our next note, the D, so, we know that the D is the root of the 6th chord, the D minor. Now, can the 5 chord go to the 6th chord? Well, sometimes it does like to go to the 6th chord. We see that here. Not only does it go to the 1, but it likes to move to the 6. So, we also know from our Toby Brush that a chord can move up a second. So five to six, C to D would be moving up a second. And I think we'll just do that. Oh, D minor, our minor six chord. Now we have the E. So 
Which chords does the E belong to? We have the A minor, A, C, E, but the E is in the fifth, or the E is the fifth of the chord. And we're only going to be using root position and first inversion chords. Okay, so that would mean that we would need to use either the E diminished in root position or the C major in first inversion. Now, diminished chords are usually used in first inversion. So, let's just use the C. That'd be a C over E. And that is a five chord. So you might be wondering, can the six go to the five chord? It doesn't show that here, but as you see here in our Toby Rush, that any chord can move to the dominant. So that will work. And now we have an F. We know that's the root of our one chord. And we know that five likes to go to one. All right. So we could go back to the sixth chord in first inversion, but I think we'll go to the one. Now we have an A in the bass. So our obvious choice would be the A minor in root position. We could also use the one six because the A is the third of the F major. And that's about it. So um, we haven't used a three chord yet. So let's try that. A minor. Next we have a B flat. And we could use the G minor, the two chord in first inversion. Or we could use the four chord in root position. Um, does three like to go to two? No but it does like to go to four. So let's just use the four chord. There's B flat, four. Now we have the C and the four likes to go to five. So that makes that choice easy. And we're back to F, which would be our one chord. Okay. So now we have our progression laid out. One, four, five, six, five, one, three, four, five, one. So that follows the guidelines of the harmonic progression just fine. So our next step is to create a melody. And we can only use chord tones right now. We're not using any non-chord tones. So, basically, we just go chord by chord and pick notes that belong to each chord to create an interesting melody. So, in my textbook on page 67, you have the guidelines for creating a nice melodic line. So the rhythm, we want to keep it simple with most durations being equal to or longer than the duration of the beat. And the final note should occur on a strong beat. Now, every melody, this is harmony, um, every melody note should belong to the chord that is to harmonize it. And that's what we just talked about. And the melody should be primarily conjunct or stepwise motion. The shape of the melody should be interesting, but clear and simple, with a single focal point, the highest note of the melody. So.
So we have some other things to consider um, with the leaps. We want to avoid augmented intervals, avoid sevenths and intervals larger than an octave. Diminished intervals may be used if the melody changes direction by step immediately after the interval. So if you're leaping up, you want it to change by step going down. If you're leaping down, you want to change it by step going up. A melodic interval larger than a perfect fourth is usually best approached and left in the direction opposite to the leap. So if you leap up larger than a perfect fourth, you want to leave in the direction opposite. And when smaller leaps are used consecutively in the same direction, they should outline a triad. So leaps that are moving in succession, it should be part of a chord, a single triad. Now tendency tones, um, in tonal music, the seventh scale degree, the leading tone, has a strong tendency to move up to one. An exception is the scale wise line descending from one, seven, six, five. The only other tendency tone that needs to be considered is the four, the four scale degree, which often moves down to three but not with the regularity, which seven goes to one. So keeping those things in mind, let's try to make a nice melody. So with our first chord, F major, we can choose F, A, and C. So F, A, or C. I'm going to choose the C. Now, B flat. We have B flat, D, and F to choose from. Now, I think I'll choose the D because that creates a nice contrary motion between the soprano and the bass. And for the C, we have C, E, and G to choose from. So to keep that contrary motion going, I'm going to go back to C. Okay, D minor. We have D, F, and A. So we could go back to the D or we could go up to the F, or we could use the A. Now that F's pretty high, and I want to save that for our focal point for the end of the song. We've already gone to the D. Um, and going from C to D, if we chose the D right here, that would automatically create parallel octaves in the bass and soprano. So let's choose the A. Okay, so where were we? We're on the C chord. Um, we could go down to the G, or we could go back up to C. Um, I think we've played the C a lot. So let's go down to G. All right, and that creates contrary motion again with the bass line. Now the bass line moves up to F. Now we have F, A, and C to choose from. We could go back to the A We'll go down to the F. Now, what happens if we go back to the A? See any problem with that? No, E to G, F to A. Those are both thirds. So we're good. And the A minor chord 
we have the A, C, and E to choose from. So we could keep the common tone, the A, or go up to C, or go down here to the E. Um, let's see. I think we'll start having our melody rise up to the end. So we'll choose the C. Now B flat major. We have the B flat, the D, and the F to choose from. And I want our melody to rise. So I'm going to choose the D. And for the C, we're just going to keep walking that up. E to F, our focal point, ending on a strong beat. So there's our melody that we're going to be working with. Now, we may decide to change some notes along the way um, due to unavoidable um, voice leading errors, but this is what we're going to be working with uh, for now. So, all right, why don't we hear how that sounds? Okay, so let's listen to our melody. I think that sounds pretty nice. Simple, interesting contour. Alright, let's hear it with the bass line. I think we can work with that. Cool. Okay, so now that we have a melody that we like and a chord progression, we can begin to fill in the inner voices. So, remembering our part writing rules, the horizontal rules from Toby Rush. Remember these three rules. Keeping the common tone is always cool. Move to the nearest chord tone and use contrary motion. Okay. And these are our doubling rules. So we'll keep this handy. All right. The main thing to remember is that in root position triads, composers double the base of the chord. And in major first inversion, composers double the soprano, so whatever note is in the soprano. In minor first inversion, you get your choice, the bass or soprano. All right, so here we go. We have the F and the A. So which note do we want to double? That's right, we want to double the root of the chord. And we have a C, so we need another F, and we also need an A. Okay. So let's try our F here. We doubled that, so that would leave our A here. Now in the B flat, we have the B flat, D, and F. So which note are we going to double? That's right, the root, the B flat. So let's just move that A up to the nearest chord tone. B flat. And we'll keep our common tone, the F.
That looks good. We have a perfect fifth here. It's moving to a sixth, so that's good. And our octave is moving in oblique motion. B to F to a fifth, so we're good. Now, our C chord. Root position major, we want to double what? The root of the chord. So, we have a C and a C. Doubling's already done. So, we know that we just need an E and a G. Now, we could move the E here and the G here, but that would create a spacing error between the alto and the tenor. If yes, because E to E is an octave here. So let's move our E here. Get that nice space, and we'll just bring our G down here. All right. So we have an octave in the bass and tenor, moving to a fifth. Contrary motion, perfect. And we have another sixth here, so E to C, the minor sixth. All right. Um, B flat to F is a perfect fifth. G to E is a major six, so we're good there. B flat to F from bass and alto is also a fifth. So, but we're moving C to E, which is a third. So this measure's good. All right. Okay, so now we have our sixth chord, the D minor. So, we know that we need a D, an F, Oh wait, no, we need, um, yeah, D, F, and A. Okay, so we have a D and an A. Hmm. And we want to double the root. So, we could do, if we did an A here, Hmm, we want to double the root though. And an A wouldn't work anyway, that would be parallel fifths. So, we can do the F down here. Eh. Let's see what that would be like. F here, and D here. That's a possibility. We have a sixth moving to a perfect fifth. And we have a fifth moving to a third. So what about our octaves? We've got a C to C. Moving to a fifth. So that will work. Then we have a, a C over E. Now we need a C, an E, and a G. So we have an E and a G. And in first inversion major triads, we want to double the soprano. So we'd want to double the G. We have the E. So we could move the C here, but that would create parallel fifths, right? D to A, C to G. So we know we don't want to do that. Hmm. 
we know we need a C because we have to have a root of our chord. So, hmm. you can put the C here. We need a third of our chord. Um, and we want to try and double. Well, so we need to have all members of the chord. Um, and the only one that we can really omit is the fifth. You have to have a root and a third to define a triad. Um, because the third is so important because it defines if it's major or minor. So, in this case, we're going to double the bass here. Hmm. So let's check that. D, D, an octave and bass and alto to octaves and E's in the same two voices. Parallel octaves. Okay, we do not want that. Um, so, what if we switched these two voices? So, we'll bring our D here. F here. Okay, so we have a leap from a G to a D, that's a fifth, but it leaves by step in the opposite direction. Remember, leaps larger than a perfect fourth should leave in the opposite direction. So that's cool there. Um, see if there's any other parallels. There's an octave. A minor sixth, E to C. Okay, we have a D to an A. These are contrary motion. Very good. And, oops, D to A. There's a perfect fifth, C to G, another perfect fifth. So, I'm thinking, maybe we just change our melody note. Sometimes you have to do this, and it can be frustrating, but that's how theory is sometimes. And it does sound good in the end. It creates texture that you can really hear. So, let's see. Now we have our um, doubling in the soprano, which is good. So now we just need the fifth of our chord, the G. We'll put that there. Okay. And I think that fixed the problem. Yes. Good. I don't see any parallels now. Okay. So now we have the F major, our one chord. So we need an F, an A, and a C, and we want to double the F. Um, we have a common tone here. There's our C. And we can just put our F right there. Okay, so we have a minor six to a perfect fifth. We're good there. C to G is a perfect fifth, but it's moving to a perfect fourth. C to C, an octave, and tenor and soprano, moving to C to A. 
which is a major sixth. So we're good. All right, we fixed the problem. Now moving on to our three chord, the A minor. So we know that we need an A, a C, and an E. And we're going to be doubling the root again. So... We can safely go here. Because we want to double the root, so we're not going to keep the common tone this time. And that would leave us with an E here. And we have a fifth to an octave. And an octave moving in contrary motion, so we're safe. Almost there now. Our B flat major, we know that we need a B flat, a D, and an F. And again, we want to double the root. So, let's see if we can do that. Well, we can't do that here. Why? Well, if you look back here, we have an octave in A's in the same two voices. So that would create parallel octaves. Okay, now the E can go to the B flat here, but E to B flat, what interval is that? Well, E to B is a fifth, so E to B flat would be a diminished fifth. And we have to leave. In, uh, by step in the opposite direction. So that would put us on an A here. And there's no A in the C chord. So let's just make this an F. We could go down to the D too. Um, but then we'd be doubling the soprano. Which we might end up doing anyway. Um, to avoid parallel octaves. So doubling rules comes second to voice leading errors. We want to avoid voice leading errors first. So we didn't double the B flat. That's okay. At least we avoided parallels. <laughs> okay, so, and the E, um, that is the leading tone, right? The seven scale degree, and it likes to go up to one. That's a tendency tone, seven to one. Okay, so, uh, let me check real quick again for parallels. A to E, that's a perfect fifth. D to F is a third, so we're good. Octave to a tenth, so that's good. And these are six, so we're cool. Now our C chord, we need a C, E, and a G. So we want to try and double the root, and we need a G. So Moving to the nearest chord tone, F moves nicely to G. Parallel sixths are fine. It's parallel fifths and octaves we're worried about. And we can safely put our octave here. Contrary motion. Um, yes, okay, very good. Our last chord, F major, we need an F, an A, and a C. Our bass is already doubled in the soprano, so we just need an A and a C. 
Oh. We could keep the common tone. And just move that G up one chord tone to an A. Oops, this is a whole note. Okay. Oh, I check for parallels. Six to a six again, ascending six is fine. C to C to C an octave, and then F to C oblique motion. We're good. C to G is a perfect fifth. It's moving to a third again. So yes. Contrary motion works. All right. Now you may be wondering, okay, there's a C to an F. That's quite a stretch, isn't it? But you can have as much distance between the tenor and the bass as you want. It's the other voices that we're more concerned with keeping within an octave or less. So we've checked for parallels along the way. So we don't have to do that now. Uh, the next step would be just to listen to it and hear how it sounds. So, Okay, so let's hear how that sounds. That was beautiful. I had to stretch the, um, it's hard to stretch the F to the C, right? So I just moved it up for that last chord. Chorales were made for singers to play. Um, so sometimes it's hard for piano players to voice their chords in exactly the same way. Um, but we do our best. And I think that made a beautiful sound. So uh, I hope you all agree. And I hope this helps you in your own compositions. Uh, so when you know these little rules um, and the techniques to follow um, to avoid parallels, uh, it makes it pretty easy. I remember when I first started, I was getting parallels everywhere, and it was so frustrating until I started applying these rules. Okay, so I will see you in the next lesson. Thanks again for watching. Bye-bye.